not going out because they can't afford it or but whatever. They, I mean, going out and going to schools. I mean, they. Oh no, um, no one, no one leaves the canyon much. They go leave for maybe a year when they're 13 and come back. Okay. Then the only time they leave is if they need dialysis or if they got busted for alcohol. And they have established like a school there. At the, uh, no, but they're, they're yeah. building a school now, which is big time. That's we just heard. We just talked to uh, Soup High Waters this week. On the plateau, they're going to build a high. They have a, they have a grammar school, but okay. at 13 you got shipped out. Okay. Now they're going to build a high school right up on the canyon, above them. So now the Soup High will have their own school. They won't have to go to Riverside, California, okay, or Oklahoma. But Phoenix. they didn't all go out to the schools. They, they all did. You oh, had to, but they, they all, required. after one year, finished. That was it. Oh, but that would have been, been the younger ones, the elders. The older, the, at 13, the, once grammar school was done, there was a grammar school right in the village. Once that's done at 13, they shipped you away, and everybody couldn't, most everyone, we don't know of anyone that, that stayed through high school. Most after one year said, that's it, I can't deal with this. I don't blame them. They couldn't even speak much English. No, you know? of course. Yeah, so, Lloyd, Lloyd, there were few, there were few Ancient ones that didn't go to high school. It was only after point. like 75 that, so that this all yeah. started happening. Yeah. yeah well, no, no, that. they've been, yes, in about 75 they started taking them out to school. Yeah, before that they stayed there and had their yeah. education. Yeah. yeah so what he's saying is that when a human being is free of this system, if you're willing to keep purifying yourself, you get to level one. You know the plants that will help. You're a medicine man, you're a shaman, you're a fire keeper. If you're willing to keep going into deeper levels of trust and respect for the Creator, you get to level two. Then you can control the forces of nature. You can bring rain to the tribe. You can make the snow stop, whatever. You can actually do it, but we don't have a scientific word for that. If you get even at the highest level, like you said, if you misuse this, you can bring sickness in your own family, death. The highest level, what he said was simple, but think what he said, you're in touch with spiritual beings. You actually make contact. Kubler-Ross said they were, your guys and teachers are right there two feet from you. They materialized on stage with her and, and had 75 people witness it. Um, you know, if you remember the Kubler-Ross tape, she's saying that they were, and we've been saying we're not just physical bodies. And, you know, guides helped me, and this coincident happened. I mean, for 30 years, it's been the dialogue of our culture that nothing's a coincidence, and can you believe this happened? I needed money, and the check came in the mail. And there's, you know what I mean? We're all talking about it. Mm -hmm. But what does that really mean? That is true. There are spiritual non-incarnate beings mm -hmm. that are surrounding this planet and ourselves individually. And this is a segue into Hopis. I'm going to tell you how the Hopis are still in contact with these spiritual beings on a daily basis. So do we believe that? I mean, everyone in here, through their own spiritual search, is this is all not new information. How many people believe in spiritual divine beings? Oh. Around? Okay, I, I believe it, but I don't live it. I believe it, but I don't know it. I don't believe it, but I don't trust it enough to do it. So we have to move from belief into trust and living it and knowing it. And like Kubler Ross says, they won't help unless you ask. You have to ask. Because that means you know. So, you know, tonight, today, whenever. Ask your spirit guides, the people that have preceded you in death and the ones you've never come in contact with in this incarnation. I'm struggling because I just got a divorce. I'm struggling because I lost someone through death. I'm struggling because I'm trying to figure out what to do next in my young life. Guide me. They are there. And the Hopis will tell you about that. So, so um, our time with them uh, introduced us to people that live the old way, explain this phenomenon, not phenomenon, this what happens when you live past this system. And we um, later went at, we were doing, we did, um, we're going to get to this next, we went and did five free concerts at the bottom of the Grand, uh, excuse me, at the Hopi Reservation. Brought reggae artists from around the country, even from, uh, from Jamaica, and did five free concerts there. Supai Waters called us and said to us, they're trying to get the tribal council to approve uranium leases. If they mine uranium, because they own 255,000 acres of the Grand Canyon, the only part that's not owned by the federal government is to have a Supai reservation. They're trying to get our uranium. If they dig up the uranium, it'll, the trailings will go into our creek and, the, and we'll lose it forever. And the tribal council, which is very Babylon-oriented, 
will approve it, but the approval process doesn't happen to the next elections. So would you come down here with a concert? So we said, absolutely. So we had a big sign up that said, Reclaim the Grand Canyon, R-E-C-A-L-I-M. Or we could have said, W-E-C-L-A-I-M, We Claim the Grand Canyon. We invited Radford, the Hopi elder, to come and talk. We invited um, Uproots from Yuma, Arizona, Native American reggae band to perform. And we helicoptered in six helicopter loads of equipment, staging, instruments, lighting, and set it up in the courtyard of the school. And we helicoptered Radford and his family in and people from the Leonard Pelcher Foundation, the Native American activist who's been in jail 30 years. And the BIA approved it. The Bureau of Indian Affairs which wanted these uranium leases to happen. They were manipulating the tribal leadership and they thought the election was in the bag. They didn't know what our message was going to be. They just thought it was a one love concert. Oh well, why not? One love concert. <laughs> so the BIA gave us a stamp of approval. Yeah, you can come down and do the concert here. So on this, uh, this day we helicoptered and all that stuff. And um, then during that four hour concert, different people spoke. And the BIA police officers in the back, when they realized what was happening, was on their walkie-talkies, but it was too late. And here was the message. Julia spoke, I spoke, Radford spoke, people from Leonard Pelcher spoke, uh, Dawn spoke, Radford's daughter, and the Uproot Band all had the same message. You have been told through your myths that you are the guardian of the heart of Mother Earth, the Grand Canyon. You're the guardian of the heart of Mother Earth. If your leaders don't know that, or your uranium company officials, the Bureau of Management of Indian Affairs don't know that, they don't know who you are. They think you're just ignorant, illiterate savages. And you never take, and they're children, can't blame them, they're children. You never take advice from children. You take advice from elders. So don't elect anyone that doesn't know who you are. You don't have to run, operate a computer, know how to drive a car, know how to read in order to be a guardian of the heart of Mother Earth. That is better that you don't. You don't have to never want to leave. It's better that you don't. Because this is your this is your mission here. So don't elect an official who doesn't know who you are, and don't take any advice from anyone who doesn't know who you are, because they're children. And you are the guardians of the heart of Mother Earth. And then the Hopi elder gets up there and says, we just turned down... 28 million dollars a year for not doing gambling and we're only the second of 225 tribes beside the airport to do this and we turned down 28 million a year which is two-thirds of what our budget would be because we did not want to sell out you have a beautiful place here don't let them take that place away from you and the Hopi elder is high held in the highest esteem of all indigenous people he came down there and told him don't do this and two months later, they elected an all-traditional tribal council. They stopped the uranium leases. The Obama administration just said they're making that permanent. There'll be no uranium yeah. leases and they have a super by reservation. And the only reason they would have done it, of course, would have been for the revenue that we would oh, yeah. give them. Yeah. That's oh, yeah, you'll get a pickup truck. Your kids yeah. will go to college. You'll get a computer. Yeah. You'll get diabetes. Yeah. 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 So once again, like we were in Jamaica with Bob Marley's birthday, Julia and I were used to bring a certain necessary healing to this tribe that we had not understood we were being used for. We had no idea that part of what our path would be would be to assist in saving the Grand Canyon. Thank you, Robert and Julia. Yes. <laughs> Good pleasure. Yeah. I didn't know what you were doing. I hadn't no. read your books, knew nothing about it. I'm just, my mouth is wide open. I'm like, yeah. wow. And there's more yet wow. to come. There's wow. more yet to come. We were the, we, we precipitated the defeat of the, of the gambling initiative in Hopi Land. And that's the story coming up after oh, the break. Cool, cool. And you're going to meet Radford Kohamnawa. So before we take a break, though, I want to show you a couple of images that I didn't have for last night when I was talking. So let me just show you that, and then we'll take a break, and then we'll do the Hopi Land. Is Dawn on this Hopi Land one? Who? Dawn. Uh, I have to look and see. I'm not, not sure. Um, oh, by the way, this is our... Goodness. 
This is our, our prison, um, the band Laura Reed. That's Laura Reed there at the prison. That's the woman who wanted to pity the prisoners. So this is us in Taylorsville, North Carolina at the prison. Um, this is Prime Minister Patterson, uh, Stephanie Marley, Bob's daughter, Janine, his niece, and Maxine Henry, who was in charge of the concert. This is before she stopped the, um, uh, the press conference. You can see she's thinking heavy something. Yeah, she's like, hmm, what do I have to do now? Hmm, I ain't going to let this get away with it. These are the, the Rastafarian group that we meet with in Taylorsville. Let's see. See that man that I'm standing next to? Yeah, um, I, twice your size. Yeah. <laughs> I, he came up to me one day. He says, hey, we're really good friends. I've loved him through all the years. And he, um, he comes up to me and says, I don't know, are you shrinking or am I getting taller? And I said, well, I probably am shrinking. He says, yeah, but I've grown three inches. You know, and he's only... He's a, he's, a thir he's 37. He just keeps growing and growing. Oh. He's chosen the Muslim Muslim um, belief now. I kind of miss him in the thing, but he's always, whenever we meet, he shows up to assist anyway, so he's always there. Yeah. And can you, I mean, Julian, I mean, it just pictures a non sequitur. You know, here you got all these black roster from prisons with this white middle class couple. But I tell you, there's such a love in that chapel when we go there between all of us. There's such a beautiful experience. And one day I told them, I said, we, we, they made a big, a big feast when we came. Now, feast for them is they all buy top ramen noodles at the concessionary stand and packages of cheese and tuna. And they make up a big tuna cheese casserole with Kool-Aid That's and, and potato chips. That's the feast for them. Kool-Aid, yeah, or whatever the, the, the drink yeah, they can the get right? at the commissary. And I, I told them, I said, you know what, tomorrow we're going to drive up to my sister's and be in a million six house and have a big Thanksgiving dinner with everything. I said, i got to tell you guys right now, this is more of our family gathering than that'll be because we're all spiritual seekers together. And we'll enjoy, we've enjoyed this more than we'll, and more relaxed with you and feeling more family with you. With Rastafarian black prisoners in Alexander Correctional Facility eating top ramen soup, then we felt with their own blood family because they were on a different spiritual path than us. Where is this, did you say? Uh, Taylorsville, yeah. North Carolina. Oh, here in, oh, here in North Carolina. Yeah, we, we go about every six, eight weeks uh, yeah, to, to this group. Some of these men are having very powerful meditations. Derek, the one, every wow. time I see him, he tells me his next, wow, he goes into some realms I've never even heard of. But he's really... He's, he's just as happy as can be. That's fabulous. Yeah, even though we'd love to get out of there. But. Well, yeah, that's pretty Now, as we roll, roll through several years in Jamaica, um, different people watched us in the news, and they started to join with us. To it hit the point that the governor general, which is the titular head of Jamaica, he's appointed by the Queen of England. Jamaica's a commonwealth of England. And he swears in the prime minister, like the queen is the titular head of England, but the Prime Minister is the head. This is um, Sir Howard Cook. He's 90-something years old. He's the, he lives on a 100-acre compound in the middle of downtown Kingston with his own security operation. Yes. On Thursday nights when I was in Jamaica, I would go to the King's house and be with him and several other people, and Julia would join me if she was on the island. So the, the Governor General of the island started speaking at our events. So I would call him and say, we're going to do an event. Would you come speak? And this is the ghetto priest, Father Albert. He used to be a Jew, looks like me. Yeah, the whole time I was in Jamaica, people said, and I'm in Jamaica, no one says you look like anybody in Jamaica because I was 98% black, tall Africans. Yeah. And I said, oh, you look like Father Albert. You look like Father Albert. <laughs> and sure enough, he's a little bald-headed Jewish guy who became a Catholic <laughs> priest and he works in the, in, the, in the ghetto. So he did our benedictions. So by the time we were at that level, the entire society from the grassroots level of poor Rasta to the highest level of political power had endorsed what we were doing if they were in a one love vibration. So if you didn't like the fact we hung out with elder Rastas and reggae artists, we had gospel people that were performing with us. If you didn't like the fact we were grassroots, we had college professors and governor generals and performing with us. If you didn't like the fact we were hanging out with Rastafarians, we had Catholic priests working with us. You could get the message at any level if you wanted the message. It was there. 
And so that, that's, um, so there's Alicia and Julia, of course. This is an event we did called, we did our own One Love Leadership thing. You know, I told you we went to the um, leadership event, um, the prayer breakfast. Well, we decided we would have a One Love Leadership event. We rented the top room of a big hotel downtown, and we invited 200 Jamaican leaders at all levels to come to claim themselves to teach love to the people. And the fact that the Governor General was going to be our opening speaker and Father Albert was going to do the benediction, followed by Trevor Monroe, who's been a senator for 30 years, uh, Barry Chavans, who's at the University of West Indies, Antoinette Houghton, reggae artist, the room filled up with 200 leaders. And we um, invited all of them. Julia spoke, Alicia spoke, I spoke, Governor General spoke. People performed for two hours and invited all of Jamaica's leadership to teach love to the Jamaican people. So that was our leadership event in 2004. Let's see what else do I have on here. Um, this is an example of our, um, when we would go into the schools with Abby John and other artists to bring a message to the kids, we would ask people, who are the bullies? If you're sitting behind the bully, about 10 people would point. In front, no one was gonna do it because yeah. the bully beat them up. We'd invite the bullies to come up, and they were embarrassed. They were usually women, girls. <laughs> and we'd say, look, don't be embarrassed to be a bully. The biggest bully the country's ever known was Bob Marley. He had his own gang called, he was called Tough Gong. He had a gang. He bullied everybody until he got the light and became a peacemaker. We want you to make, be a peacemaker on this school. When there's problems, when there's fight, you go make the peace. Because bullies want attention. We can give them good attention. So then we'd give them these shirts which said unity on them, and we'd get them to pledge to be the peacemaker. You're a warrior against war. Wow. And it would simmer the whole school down. Wow. Simple concepts. As you see, it's not brain yeah. surgery. What would one love do with a bully? What can you do to most effectively bring one love to a school, get the bullies transformed? Because they cause such friction. You know? How can you get the leadership to listen? get the governor general to open up. Then they'll come. They wouldn't come for a white couple, but they'll come if the governor general's gonna be there. You know, so it was, in each situation, what's the most effective way to use what limited resources that were available to Julia and I to get this message out there? Let's see, we'll take a break in just a second. Um, Where's that one where Pope um, Abijah's Going to the Hopi Reservation. And, uh, oh, that'll be coming up. Yeah, that'll be coming up. So, um, let's see. Okay, so um, let's, what time is it now? 10.35. Let's take a break till about 10.45 or 10.50, about a 15-minute break. And then we're going to take you to Hopi Land. That I have. That would be under keynotes. And then I would go to Native American, which is for some reason over on this side. Get that. And then, let's see. Mm. Uh, here, he's right here, this is him. Then I would hit play. <laughs> Dorothy, did you guys move? Yeah, we're in the little house. Oh, you like that better? Oh, it's lovely. Okay. So we keep pressing this and you'll find hope. Oh, I love the Indians. I always have. There was so much on the stuff. Yeah, here. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning.
you were feeling the vibes way back then. Yeah, that's where I found out. Yeah, about yeah. And you're picking them up again now. You got to come to all our gatherings. Have you read any of our books? Yeah, read some of the other books. Read, read the um, Beauty Path. Really? Beauty Path. Yeah, yeah. That's the, that's the you know the Native American book. Did you hear Reginald Bradislavin? No. Reginald Bradislavin? Yes, well, he, you know, she... <coughs> and then it just... After what you did, they used to turn chicken. You know, they wouldn't chicken out. Oh, no. Very chicken. I love it. Let's have it. Let's write this down on the... It always bothers me a little bit though that the men got the best spots. The women would stay in the back, just stamp their feet, shake something, you know, the men would roll the knees. <laughs> Yes. 
you know, I was going to give myself be much more time. Deeply, plan going away and things like that. And I was like, I don't want to go. And I think if, if this is going to happen, it's going to be so much more in there, too. Than, you know. Well, that's what you're saying. If this is in here, it's going to be so much more in there.
if you have a human right, right. to use consciousness at the highest level. But because of the Babylon drugs and uh, chemicals and alcohol. Hey Robert, before it gets to this point, I don't want to lose it again. How do I stop it once it gets to the point where I want to go? Okay, um, you go to the bottom. Last well, time I touched this in the... No, no you, you would go down here and stop it. You would just bring bring the uh, thing down, you know, into here. Oh, and you stop okay. it. Okay, that will start it. But um, you, you're not going to be able to get there because I need to start showing this in a different place. So where do you want to get to? I, could you just do me a favor and just play that little bit of Dawn? So that yeah, okay. get that yeah, flavor. Let me get Dawn. Well, I, I, that's what I'm saying. It's coming up. It's almost Yeah, I can move it fast over there. It's <laughs> <laughs> like two minutes away. Uh, no, because that guy comes out and dance. Yeah, about two minutes away. Let me move it up there. Oh, you want to actually show this first? I, don't I think it's a wonderful piece. It's yeah. my favorite piece. It yeah. tells me, well, how did we end up there? This tells it, you know? Okay. Um, you never play this in the, it's, to me. Oh, yeah, I play it. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I barely see it. No, so. I play this. I play this whole thing. Oh, so you are going to play this? Yeah. Okay. As long as it doesn't get left out. I yeah, no, I'm going to play this whole piece. Yeah. Maybe you guys tied up for my books. Sorry. I think we could. No, no. Not at all. I think. 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 I the song, the video that you have, that's the way God planned it. Uh -huh. Do you have the whole song? Um, yeah, yeah. You weren't here the first time we played it. Oh, I just couldn't get the sound. I couldn't get the sound going until halfway through. Is it something that you can give away, or is it something? No, you have it's to on. Keep? It's on the Bangladesh. I bought the Bangladesh uh, album. Oh, okay. it's on the Bangladesh concert album. Okay. You don't have to make a copy. You get to make a copy. needs an audience, so some of you will gather up front. We're going to talk about the Hopis and their 975-year covenant to become the first peaceful people.
take you to a mystical place because I'm going to tell you about spirit beings. And if you want to think spirit beings are only working with us through people like the Hopi Indians, I want to show you crop circles. Let's see, I think this is the... Um, well, you're about to see the most recent crop circles. They were called crop circles. They were, um, they were circles. And so scientists said, oh, there was a burst of wind made a circle in the wheat, right? And then they started to be crop formations, kind of designs. And they said, oh, if not a burst of wind could make a design. Oh, these two farmers have, have now confessed that they took a board out there and made it all over England, this area of England. Okay, news stopped covering and hadn't heard anything about it in 15 years. Crop circles were fake. Much farmers did it. Heard nothing about crop circles in the main news. You're about to see the recent crop circles. Here's what you need to know about them. They occur overnight. In some cases, planes have gone over and, and I, gone over again the same field a half hour, an hour later, and they're there then. They happen like that, and scientists will agree it would take months to do them. Not one day, not, not overnight. There's never, in the real crop circle, not the fake ones, you're about to see real ones, there's no sign of egress or entrance. There's no foot tracks. There's no motorcycle tracks. There's no car tracks. There's no sign of anyone having spent hours doing this. They're never half finished. They're all completed the next morning. There's never a mistake. Nothing happens without a mistake. You're not going to make something five times the size of this building in a field of an elaborate design that you're about to see and not make a mistake. It's not like they got this line off. Once you make a mistake, you can't fix it. You know? So they had to get it all perfectly right. This may be two football fields across. And there's no evidence that anybody came and went through here. Right? <laughs> this is a simple one. And the where they're bent, where the stalks are bent, they're not bent like mechanically bent. There's a molecular straight change in the actual wheat or corn that bent it. When they when they go in and put it under a microscope, they, something has changed molecularly in the in the wheat or corn, right? And in some of the patterns where it's big flat areas, everything's woven together. That would have take hundreds of people hours to do. In other words, you have uh, something as big as this building and every piece of grain is woven to the one below it and in intricate paths like ba basket weaving that you would have had to have people sit on the ground and do a little square move and move and move and there's no signs of egress or entrance. So if we, and these aren't swastikers and skeletons, these are profoundly beautiful images. Disincarnate beings are contacting us now in the most amazing, profound ways, and to a degree they have never contacted the human race before. It's always been one person here, cave art here, an incident over here. They've never left a calling card for everyone to see who willing to get on the internet and look for it. And one day I got up, I told Julia we gotta do a crop circle DVD, I mean, um, piece for YouTube, and put Travis Terry's music to it. You'll see humans in here, and you'll get a sense of the size of these things. They're huge. Some of them up to three quarters of a mile long. See the humans? No, this one, you know, that's a fly on the screen, sorry. Most of them are in England, but they were occurring in the U.S., Brazil, Italy, but most of them in one area of England. Yeah, 
be the place where for some reason thousands of years ago they drug these impossible sized stones stood them up around one another and do something. Yeah. It's been happening in England for a long time. Yeah, this is near Stonehenge. Four hundred and nine circles. Farmers with a board and a stick? I don't think so. Are they still there? Well, they're there for two, three days till they start popping back up. And the fields are, they don't want it to be studied by science. They want those of us that are open-hearted and open-minded enough to accept their existence. See the people in it? This is meant to be looked at, the information of what's being said will come at a later date. This is being meant to be looked at by people like us to acknowledge, yes, this is their calling card, they're here. And if you're skeptical or it's threatening to you or you say, ah, oh, a bunch of BS, but you can take your friends back home under my name on YouTube and watch this with them and ask them, what do you think? No one's claimed it. I mean, if somebody would claim this art, they could sell it for in, in pendants and t-shirts. They could say, we're their crop circle. They make a fortune. Nobody wants money from this. And all they got to do is come forward and say, we the people have been doing the crop circles. They'd be millionaires overnight. Or they could say they manipulated a computer and, is that what you're saying, and, and try and capitalize on it? What's that? No, if humans were doing this, they could make a fortune by claiming we did it and showing how they did it. Well, no human could do that, obviously. That's right. But could a, could a computer manipul be manipulated to look like that? Oh, you could get a computer. You could take a picture of this and reproduce it in a computer. Uh -huh. But the computer couldn't go out and do that in the field. No, no. exactly. But, I mean, uh, people have seen them not just on a computer. They've seen them. Like oh yeah, oh yeah. Those these are all pictures. The field there in the middle of one. Yeah, they, these are aerial pictures. Fairly carefully documented. These are all, all aerial pictures. Wheat, corn, barley. It happens at the height of the season. They time it to right before the farmer was going to cut. Like they don't want it there. Not to meant to be studied by scientists. It's meant to be seen by people who can accept their reality. Well, look at the fading in that. How frequently are they? I mean, there are times that I'll be showing up to the dates. Do you have the dates in which these dates have shown up? Now, all these about the last three to four years. This Jewish star in that one, Star of David. Jewelry with these designs on them, T-shirts. See a couple of people in the middle of that. Overnight, no signs of interest in egress or farmer with the board. Uh-uh. footprints everywhere and yeah. you'd make mistakes because yeah. this is rolling hills some of it's not level ground and you have to lay it out on level ground to be perceived from above imagine the logistically trying to, to re we have an hour and a half DVD on this we may show late tonight for those who want to see it how many would like to see that full DVD on this Someone on the side of there. Look at that. Can you imagine laying that out without a mistake? Could not be done. Even if you had weeks to do it, you'd make mistakes. 
you leave tracks. Well, Once you bend it, you can't correct it. You can't pull it back up. So. Well, it's been occurring for centuries, but not at this level. It's been so, right, right. So they've become much more intricate than they ever were. The greatest skeptic you can meet to who would say no, there's nothing happening on a spiritual plane. What is that one? Would have a problem explaining that one away. I've seen even skeptical people get blown away. We had a doctor take one of the program, a very very skeptical person. He just came to the program to protect his his fiance, make sure she didn't link up with somebody. That relationship didn't last. Uh, and he very negative, very skeptical person. And he when he, and he didn't buy anything we were saying. Then we saw this part. And, you know he. Didn't, he couldn't compute. He had a thousand questions about it. You know, so the same disincarnate spirits that are creating crop circles are also writing this book. All right, here's about being in the moment, identifying with the being behind all life, the being behind all life. We're all one. Being behind all life, you realize that the particular form that you are conscious of projecting through at the moment is not really who you are. As you begin to see your body as an exquisite exploratory instrument designed for the expression of your spirit, you begin to relax. Your preoccupation with survival begins to fall away. It's not that the body becomes unimportant. You are not your body. You are not your thoughts. You are not what you feel, not your role or your experience. You are the spirit of life itself dancing in the clay, delighting in the glorious opportunity of incarnation, exploring the realms of matter, blessing the earth and all therein. The psychological process of getting a brainwashing, we're brainwashing you. You can tell me when you came here you got brainwashed. Your brain was dirty and we washed it for you. <laughs> <laughs> they brainwashed me, they brainwashed yeah, me. Right. The psychological process that triggers this awareness takes place in the present moment. You must be there fully present to experience it. This is not difficult. Simply be aware of whatever you are doing. If you are slicing bread, do not be thinking of your thirst. If you are listening to a friend, do not be thinking of what you're going to say next. That's my big issue. If you are eating a meal, do not be thinking of what you're going to do when the meal is over. But show the earth the appreciation of your fullest attention. In whatever activity you engage, be there fully in consciousness also. This will draw you into the presence of God and quickly show you what areas of your life are most in need of adjustment. The question is not how much presence of God can you bring into your life, but how much of your life can you bring into the presence of God. The presence of God is everywhere. You have only consciously to embrace it with your attention. Same being, you can see the same profound power, but gentleness, compassion, and understanding of, for the human predicament. There's no judgment that comes through this consciousness. And this total understanding of who we are and the, and the way we've gotten lost, with no judgment or condemnation. And saying, here, my brother, sister, let me help you back home. Let me bring you help you back home. Because you were the ones that volunteered to come and work this thing out and we want to big you up for doing it. Every one of you on planet Earth. Been a tough assignment. You volunteer to go and do it. So there's no judgment to all of us down here doing the work by those that didn't come down to do, do that work but assisted from the other side. So that, that goes into the Hopis. Um, it's an interesting way to go to the Hopis, isn't it? Let me tell you about the Hopi Indians. And I'll tell you how we met them. Um, the Hopi Indians, let me show you what one of their villages look like. There's 12 villages, 12,000 Hopis, and if you, um, let's see, uh, cancel, okay. this is Hopi land, uh, let's
let's see. There we go. This is the two villages here. He's, you know, this is like, um, what's that thing? I, I spy not, you know, when you look on a thing and say, oh, I spy this or whatever. Mm -hmm. Can you see the Hopi village? No, you can barely see it. This is one village. And this is the other village. Wow. That's a Hopi village. Roots. 12,000 people living out there. And this is the mother village of Shalopavi. And this is the ancient village of Walpine. And this is, uh, and there's nine, ten other villages uh, along this road, all within maybe 25, 30 miles of each other. So here's the story, and there's uh, several books you can get with this story in it. It got released not long ago, about 25, 30 years ago. Here's their legend. The Hopi say that we are the covenant people, along with several other tribes around the planet. And we came down, and we're supposed to become Hopi, which is world for peaceful people. We're not Hopi. We're becoming Hopi. At all of our ceremonies, there's a clown to make us laugh at ourselves to remember our follies. But we will be one of the first, if not the first, tribe to become totally peaceful so that we can put that imprint out into the human consciousness so that all tribes can follow and have that pattern. So that the work we do, we do for all of humanity. And we're not allowed to pray for ourselves, for our clans, for our tribes. Every Hopi prayer is a prayer to all of humanity. So when the white man came and did his brutal frenzy on our tribe, we could not hate him because we were doing the work for, of this covenant for all people. Right? You see where they're coming from? Very high level. So they say they came out of the Grand Canyon in, a, in a, a, a place that they know of. They came into the, this world, and they migrated for thousands of years. They became the Cherokees here, right here. These were the ancient Hopi ancestors. They became the Sioux, the Lakota, the Cree. They went all through, they went in four directions out of the Grand Canyon. And they became the Incas, the Aztec, the Mayans. And the Mayan elders that we worked with in Guatemala confirmed this. And we're going to probably not get to my ends until after the, after the circle tonight because I don't want to rush through this and, and it's too much information. So the fact that we didn't have the band the first night gives me room tonight. So we'll get into the 2012 uh, after the circle. So we became the Mayans. And, and what the Creator said is keep migrating until I tell you to stop. And I'm going to send you signs when it's time to go. So they'd be here for hundreds of years. And the Cherokee were very high thinkers very high spiritual people. And then the sign came and that spiritual leadership went on somewhere else. The reason all the Mayan ruins, which are ceremonial cities, were deserted and they never can figure out why they leave Chichen Itza and Tikal and Tulum in these vast cities and they just left them. There was no sign of war or famine or drought. It's because after hundreds of years, the sign would come and the leadership, spiritual leadership left and went north towards Arizona. And when the the spiritual leader, the ceremonial cities went into decay. And that's why the Hopi say that these, which archaeologists have never heard and don't know, that's why they've never been able to figure out why the ruins in South, South and Central America were abandoned for no apparent reason after hundreds of years of building these things. It was time to go. So they said, eventually, we'll take you where you stop. So they go up from from uh, Guatemala and central Mexico, and they go to, Ana, uh, to Anastasi Cliff Ruins. They were the cliff dwellers outside of Sedona in that area. And then they get to this place. And the creator says, this is it. Thousands of years, this is it. And I can only see what it must have been like. This is it. There's no water. There's, there's 12 little springs. There's no lakes. There's no creeks. It's brutally hot in the summer. It's cold in the winter. I mean, what about Sedona, where you had us 100 years ago? There was a big creek through there and trees. And what about the San Francisco peaks outside of Flagstaff? There's trees and water. This is it. Nobody else lives there. And the creator said, yeah, and, and this is why. No one will want your land. They thought, well, why is that a problem? Well, because things will happen in the future where they're going to be taking your land. But no one will want your land. This is the only tribe that has not been pushed off their land. 600 tribes have lost their land. Cherokee got pushed off and came back and got it back. They're 45 minutes from here. 
their reservation, but they lost the reservation. Everyone lost the land by Hopi because nothing was out there. Who'd want it? Until they found coal, and that was by then what Indians had rights. So they said, no one will want your land. And they must have said, well, why is that important? They said, well, there'll come a time, and we're going to make your repository for all of human wisdom. Because there'll come a time when the world will go into chaos, called Konosquatsi, and it'll be lost to materialism. And it'll be upside down, and they'll forget the Creator's way. And you, along with several other people, and they now believe the Tibetan um, uh, Buddhists are one of those people, and the, um, there's a tribe in Okinawa, Japan, that is one of those people, and um, the Aborigines are one of those people, the dream people. You, along with several other people, will hold a repository for all of human wisdom so that when the world goes into chaos, which they call Konosquatsi, and this would remember being 950, 975 years ago when they got here, they're being told this in a series of tablets that they still have, four tablets. You'll go into, into chaos, the world will go into chaos, and we're going to make you a repository for all of human wisdom, and that's why we're putting you out here. Now, I can think, see if the Creator wanted to make a repository for human wisdom. He would give it to a roots indigenous tribe living way out in the desert. It ain't going to be in Mecca, or Jerusalem, Rome, Washington, New York. What we, where would you put it? If the world was going to go into Babylonian chaos and you needed to get the information secured, well, give it to this ancient tribe where they got nothing to do out there but ceremony. What else do you do out there? You don't hunt, you don't fish, you don't swim. And so he put them out there and he, and he said, well, how are we going to hold this information? He said, every clan that migrates here will have a different ceremony. And every ceremony will be a piece of human wisdom. And by the time they all gather over a couple hundred years, you're going to have a ceremonial cycle that will take a year to complete. And within that cycle will be all of human wisdom. I'm losing my two front runners up here. <laughs> you're getting too comfortable. That's why you get the wisdom. You get the wisdom through, through the information, through the dreams, through the dream state. <laughs> um, so, it, and so that's what happened over the, the from like nine from 1100 A.D to about 1300, the clans gathered, and this got people with 12 different villages. And um, the ceremonies, which we've been invited, Julia and I have been invited to see a couple of them, uh, are quite fun, profound. I mean, let's say you want it to be, first, sorry, first thing, if you're going to keep people out here, you better let them have a good time, because it's tough. You better give them something to do, because it's tough. It ain't like Cherokee, oh, let's go up in the woods and go find a deer or, or pick berries or let's, you know, cross the mountain range and go trade with the next tribe. You are alone by yourself in a, in a, in a moonscape, semi-arid, semi-fertile moonscape. That's what you did. So all you had to do was entertain yourself. That's why Hopi Land today is only two things to do, reggae concerts, high school football. You know, one carries the vibe of the original ceremonies, one, of course, doesn't. So... The creator, let, let's say you want to teach generosity. How about this for a ceremony? This is one of them we went to. This one happened in, in, in uh, this village here. So early in the morning, uh, Julia, and I think, I'm not sure Julia was at the ceremony. I think I came with some other Jamaican friends. We're invited, we go up here, and you're looking out over 100 miles of, in any direction of barren land. And you're in a village up here that looks like it did thousand years ago, but there is a TV antenna over here, an aluminum window over here, and a gas generator over here. It's making its intrusions. But it's the same buildings that were there a thousand years ago, right? And there's a courtyard about almost as big as this cafeteria, and around it are low squat buildings, about eight or ten feet tall, flat roofs. And in the courtyard is about two or three hundred tribal members, and on the roof, mostly younger people. And on the roofs are another two, three hundred, mostly older people, children and women, mostly young men up here and young kids.